If you're here for the middleman cast reunion and lost episode table read, you're in the right place. If you think we're here to read an episode of the TV show Lost, you're in the wrong place. The Middleman, episode 13, The Doomsday Armageddon Apocalypse. We begin with a title. The following paid commercial advertisement does not reflect the views of ABC Family <laughs> or The Middleman. We fade in on Manservant Neville, played by Mark Shepard, established in episode 1011, the Clotharian Contamination Protocol, standing on a black stage in a suit and dark shirt. Any resemblance to Steve Jobs doing an Apple keynote address is purely coincidental. <laughs> No, really, I'm serious. Don't you put that on me. Hi there. I'm Manservant Neville, CEO of Fatboy Industries. The and screen behind Manservant Neville lights up with an image of the U-Master, a white, chunky, cube-shaped device. An inventor of the U-Master. They said no one would buy a solar-powered handheld device made entirely of recycled parts, and now one in every 25 humans owns a U-Master. Why? It makes your life easy. So take charge and remember, you master makes you the master. The you master morphs into the fat boy mascot, the now familiar pig nose, red haired, red faced homunculus seen in every consumer product ever shown throughout the series. We fade to the fat boy industries mascot, and then we have a legend, you master from fat boy industries. We cut to black, title. We now continue with our regularly scheduled program. Fade in, exterior, Wendy and Lacey's loft, night. Caption, the illegal sublet Wendy Watson shares with another young photogenic artist. <laughs> And occasionally with her spit-curled former guitarist boyfriend, 10.30 p.m. Tyler Ford, you are not trying to convince this analog girl to get a U-Master. I'm telling you, the way Servant Neville talks about it, this new software upgrade is going to be the best thing ever. Total game changer. Now we're inside the loft. Wendy sits in the bed in her shorts and a Jolly Fats Weehawk and belly shirt. Tyler takes off his jacket and tie. <laughs> okay, let's pretend for a moment that this art school reprobate is willing to suspend her burning desire to while away a Friday night making out with the former lead guitarist of a neo-hippie jam band and is actually willing to give her newly minted tech sector workaholic boyfriend 30 seconds to talk about his project. What will this revolutionary new software upgrade do for the world's most influential handheld device actually do? Um, well, it, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Now, now that I think about it, all I've heard Minserva Neville say is how amazingly powerful it's going to be, but... Uh, Wynn and Tyler's conversation is interrupted by a visibly upset Lacey standing at the top of the spiral staircase. Hey, Wendy? Lacey, how was the vegan palace? The satan fritters were in Aria, but that's not what I came to say. What's the matter? I need a monster pep talk. See Warren's downstairs? Perfect Warren? Perfect Warren. Third date at the vegan palace, we got there in his electric scooter, and he's president of the Gorilla Recycling Collective. Oh. Yeah, the guys who break into people's homes and separate their garbage? He even, <laughs> he even wears hemp underpants and volunteers for Habit Trail of Humanity. I think you mean Habitat for Humanity. No, no, I mean Habit Trail for Humanity. They're even better. <laughs> and now Perfect, now Perfect Warren's downstairs on the couch, and he's totally got that that third day look in it, third date look in his eye. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've given that look. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't. You can't. I can't. Well, Lacey, if you can't, you can't. No. I mean, you gotta talk me into this, Dub Dub. I gotta make a move. This is perfect Warren. We have everything in common. And how many perfect Warrens are there in the world? I can't turn him away. Can I? Wendy puts her hands on Lacey's shoulders then. Lacey. Go downstairs and start making some of that stinky tea. The Tibetan cleansing brew that makes your breast smell like Jerry Garcia's butt crack. <laughs> <laughs> One and the same. I'm gonna dig up some of my old telenovela VHSs and me and Tyler are gonna watch on the downstairs couch in a tick. Perfect Warren's going down like an Atari Lynx. <laughs> <laughs> You're the best, Dub Dub. Lacey bounds down the stairs, leaving a concerned Wendy and Tyler behind. Still not over your sexy boss man, is she? And off Wendy. Now, exterior, Jolly Fats, Weehawken, day, establishing, caption, Middleman Headquarters, 9.30 a.m. You said you couldn't date Lacey because she's not the only woman you love. Fine. I can buy that. I can buy that like a bag of chips. Now we're inside the headquarters where we see Wendy rushing behind a clearly uncomfortable middleman. But you gotta give me something. I mean, who is this mysterious goddess? When do you see her? Where does she live? What is her name? Sweet, crispy wontons, W. <laughs> I 
I try to foster camaraderie and understanding in the workplace, but this is this line of questioning is downright inappropriate. Inappropriate? You have surveillance cameras in my bedroom. I'm your senior manager, and that requires a certain obscurity in my methods. And I've got Ida treating treating my private life like it's her own private Skinamax, and you can't tell me. What what do you see is what you get with me. The rest is on a need to know basis. You are just going to have to take it on trust. Look, Lacey's holding a torch for you. You're holding a torch for Lacey. The longer you ignore that, the longer you stomp on her heart with cleats. Damn it, Dubby! I, I've told you as much as I can. Why can't you respect that? And with that, the middleman steps into a room and slams the door shut. Wendy just stands there, stunned, until the middleman steps back out the door, somewhat sheepishly. Wow. Dude. <laughs> Too much club. Uh, this is awkward. What, your imminent apology? No. We have a Code 7 distress call. Code 7, one of our trusted allies is in jeopardy? Let's go to work. And off Wendy, watching him go, we're now at the exterior of the FAMOUS Fashion House. Day, note, the establishing shot on interior set designs for FAMOUS were first used in The Middleman, episode 1003, The Accidental Occidental Conception. The Middlemobile pulls up. Caption, FAMOUS Fashion House Design Studio and Covert half Halfway House for Recovering Succubi, 9.15 a.m. So, if you're talking to me again, could you tell me why Roxy Wasserman would put in a Code 7 distress call to us? <laughs> I guess that means you're not talking to me again. Now we're inside Famous Fashion House Day. The middleman steps in, followed by Wendy, to find Roxy Wasserman standing alone in the middle of the studio, none of her usual minions around her. Where are all the bulimics, furmongers, and Eurotrash? No time for snark, wedding train. You may have just been promoted from the Olive Garden, but I need a real man for this job. You did not just mock the vest. M.M. L'ingrès a frappé la ventilateur. Subtitle, M.M. The manure has hit the ventilator. <laughs> Copy that, Roxy. What's the damage? Subtitle, je comprends, quel sont les dommages. <laughs> Roxy turns to reveal two tables behind her. Lying on each table is a beautiful model, each with a scarf over her head. Somebody's kidnapping my girls. And as she pulls the scarves off the tops of their heads to reveal massive surgery scars across her foreheads. In a God of Davida. <laughs> and cutting them up. And as the middleman and Wendy react to the sight of these two beautiful fashion models, their foreheads roughly sewn together after a forced and no doubt gruesome surgery, <laughs> Middleman! <laughs> and we're back with the middleman Wendy and Roxy Wasserman. The middleman pulls out the BTRS scanner and we hear the signature BTRS sound effect. Borp. Borp. Their names are Olog and Jenna, twins from the old country. They were the most powerful girls in the coven, second only to me. Been on the wagon for years. The we don't suck souls wagon or the we look good in clothes no ordinary mortal can wear wagon? They were booked for a modeling job downtown and abducted before they even got there. We found them wandering the streets. It's exactly as I feared. Their pineal glands have been removed. Roxy Wasserman's eyes turn red. Her teeth grow to sharp saber fangs and horns grow from her head. See, there's all sorts of stuff you can do in a comic you can't do on a basic cable budget. She's in a succubinical rage! I must call out my hordes. Whoever did this shall suffer a thousand agonies. You best unhulk yourself, Roxy. You take this war to the streets, you're sabotaging everything you spent the last two decades trying to build. Roxy turns away with an imperious gesture. I need chocolate. She lets out a roar of impotent rage and walks away. The middleman turns to Wendy. The pineal gland is the seat of Zuckubus' ability to sway the minds of men, to get them to think whatever they desire. Anyone who steals them with such surgical precision is trying to take supernatural power for themselves. This is a sock hop and a dunghill. We're going to have to... <laughs> but before the middleman can finish his thought, each of the fallen succubi lift their hands and clutch Wendy. Wendy starts. Everything gets weird. We see strange faces twisted with primal fear, a waterfall, a snarling black panther. The medium, the truth speaker, the soothsayer. Only the power of Chalk Mall can stop them. Only the waterfall can hide them. Only the waterfall! And with that, the succubi let go of Wendy, who is left staring at the middleman, confused. And we cut to interior of Famous Fashion House, uh, Roxy's office, later. Roxy sits on her chair, eating bonbons from an ornate round box. Olog and Jenna mentioned the power of Chalk Mall specifically. This is very disturbing. A bad omen. 
Dark times are ahead. What's very disturbing? Well, we don't know what it means yet. No, what what means? You know too well the price exacted by the talisman. What talisman? Keep your guarders on rocks. No one's making the ultimate sacrifice on my watch. Who's making the ultimate sacrifice? Whoever wields the power of Chakmal. What is the power of Chakmal? Chakmal is the Mayan goddess of rain and thunder. Her power is held in a talisman the shape of an obsidian panther. It is said that the power of Chakmal was last wielded by Cortez in its battle against Montezuma and allowed him to overwhelm an army of 300,000 Aztecs. It is, at best, a weapon of last resort. Because of that ultimate sacrifice thing? Exactly. In exchange for victory, the wielder always pays the steepest price imaginable. Which is why that particular panther-shaped talisman has remained untouched in the deepest vault of middle middleman HQ for centuries. So, are we going to draw straws or what? No one's wielding the power of Chalk Mall. <clears throat> Our immediate goal is to decipher Olog and Jenna's oracular meanderings. The medium, the truth speaker, and the waterfall. There'll be plenty of time to panic once we know the face of our enemy. Oh, M.M., um, um, the thought of you making your last stand with a cheesy panther sculpture in one hand and that hideous throwback to Normandy on your shoulders makes me want to weep. <laughs> it can't end this way, please, for me. At least change your jacket for this mission. And we're in the Minimobile, <laughs> careening through the streets of the city. Chiron, the Minimobile, always three miles below the speed limit, 11 a.m. It's not algebra. If someone stole Olog and Jenna's pineal gland to take their psychic powers, chances are they also stole the pineal glands of a medium, a truthsayer, and a clairvoyant to take theirs. Like now we're inside the Minimobile. Like a software bundle of darkness. Except <laughs> one thing. A psychic signature of that size would have undoubtedly set off the Hadar. Un unless... Ida, it is I, the middleman. Oh, and here I was hoping for one of my gentlemen callers. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh. <laughs> you date? <laughs> I have the AARP on speed dial, and I break Earthmen like Tinder sticks. <laughs> G.O. <laughs> Ida, get on the Hadar and scan for bodies of water large enough to dampen a sizable psychic signature. Give preference standing with waterfalls. A river or lake with enough fish and algae in it might have masked the paranormal field just enough to allow our gland thieves to go undetected. This is not comforting. Leave the weeping to Roxy Dubby. Our dance card's full. Yeah, weird that she'd get so emotional over this. The thought of you making the ultimate sacrifice. It's her! Isn't it? Roxy Wasserman is the other woman you love. Mother of hello, Dolly. I am plumb tuckered with this. <laughs> Admit it, you're totally hot for her. She's a man-killing demon from hell, Dubby. A single night of sweet succubus snuggling from that woman and sayonara to my eternal soul. <laughs> so? It's a doomed romance. No wonder you're paralyzed with indecision. Listen up, chowderheads. I got a hit on your waterfall. There's only one large enough in the 30-mile zone to rape. A man-made lake just outside the Kerr Avon Labs. And now we're outside the Kerr Avon Labs. Day establishing an industrial complex nestled next to a lake with a waterfall. Chiron, Kerr Avon Labs, 12.15 p.m. Somebody cleared out of here in a hurry? Now we're inside the lab. Wendy and the middleman shine their flashlights on the remains of the lab, as well as the significant amounts of surgical equipment and several empty beds. Lots of beds. They could have had a whole mess of psychically active subjects here. Wendy picks up a file jacket left on the floor. Got a prime protocol. Clairvoyant test subject. Slam! Slam! The heavy steel doors of the lab close behind Wendy and the middleman, and then a racket. Clonk, clonk, clonk. The middleman and Wendy turn to see a massive robot armed with machine guns for arms. The middleman draws his middle gun and fires, but his bolts of energy merely bounce off the robot. Wendy leaps onto a lab bench, vaults over the robot as she draws her sidearm and fires as she trolls overhead. But as she lands in a power crouch behind the robot, the ro he deploys a nerve gas nozzle and sprays Wendy in the face. Nerve gas. Dodging bullets! <laughs> As he backs away, the middleman takes a gas mask from his utility belt and puts it on. The robot bears down on him, firing its guns. The middleman, sweat beating on his forehead, throws himself on the robot. He slips a grenade into its exoskeleton and kablooey! The robot explodes in a million pieces. The middleman rolls away and we cut to a final shot of the middleman carrying a passed out Wendy through the burning remains of the lab. And we cut to black and over black, you hear. Deep breath, Stubby. You need the oxygen. And we fade into Jolly Fats, Ops, Day. Wendy comes to in the Eames Chase, the one we saw in the Ops and Cryogenic Meltdown. And breathes from an oxygen tank as Ida cranks up the supply. Don't just huff on it, honeypot. It ain't Maui Waui. <laughs> Am I a lie? If you can call what you do living. <laughs> How did we walk into an ambush? And who leaves a combat android to guard an abandoned lab? 
caught you with your tidy whities around your ankles, did they? And now we see the middleman over by the desk, setting the real-time situation recording archive, rubbing his chin, perturbed. They knew we were coming. Whoever was working out of the lab knew about our movements and knew it with enough time to clear out and leave a heavily armed battle robot to cover their tracks. But how? Did they hack our surveillance? Did they steal the power to read people's minds from all those succubi and mediums and... The only reason we're still alive is dumb luck. A utility belt stuffed for, with grenades and a universal key. And that's no way for a middleman to live. I pooped the wooby today, Dubby. <laughs> and I almost got you killed. You saved my ass. Damn it, Dubby! I'm slipping. Did you actually just say damn it? Again? For the second time in one day? When that murderous robot came after us, I had one thing and one thing only on my mind. It was the reason I didn't see the attack coming. I've lost my focus, and I know the reason why. Stay here. Study the real-time situation recording archive in the Hadar. Don't step out of HQ until we get to the bottom of this. Where are you going? Here's something I have to do. You mean, like, go to the bathroom, bake a cake? We do have a mission, remember? The bad guy stealing supernatural powers? I won't be any good to you until this is settled. And off Wendy and Ida, watching as the middleman steps away, we go to a montage. Wendy and Ida work diligently, studying the Hadar, tapping the real-time situation recording archive. The middleman goes to headquarters, changing room, which we saw in the Manicoy teleportation conundrum. He changes out of his middle uniform into civilian clothes, a white button-down shirt, and khakis. He looks like Christopher Reeve in Superman 2. Now we're in the middlemobile, day. The middleman drives with purpose. Now we're in the middleman headquarters, ops, day. Ida wears this thing on her head. It looks like a colander. She uses it to scan Wendy, who looks at a printout. Nothing on the Hadar. No signs of heightened paranormal activity anywhere in the city. You getting anything on that? Not yet. But that might just be all the THC in your system blocking the body scan. <laughs> Wait a minute, I got a hit. It's in an ultra low frequency signal, very faint, coming from you. It's disguised into the background radiation in the atmosphere, but oh no! And we cut to the interior of Wendy and Lacey's loft, hallway day. The middleman steps out of the elevator to see Noser sitting on the Vespa, guitar in hand. Yo, Wendy's boss. <laughs> you know what I need? I'm gonna guess you either need a freak or a hero. Oh, I definitely need a hero. You and I both, Mr. Noser. And with that, the middleman slams open the door to Wendy and Lacey's loft, where Ray Lacey sits on the egg chair, standing to face the middleman. Their eyes meet. No words need to be said. The middleman closes the distance between them. He scoops up Lacey in his arm and kisses her passionately on the lips. We smash cut to exterior, Wendy and Lacey's loft, continuous. The middleman and Lacey embrace, uh, they, they, they can be seen through the loft windows as a spontaneous display of fireworks erupts over the skyline. But the moment is cut off by the sound of the middle watch. And we cut to Wendy at headquarters. She's pissed off talking into her middle watch as Ida works behind her to put something in a steel box with a tempered glass window. Boss, it's me, pick up now. Can, can this wait, Dubby? No, this is a red ball. Ida just discovered that I've been bugged. We've had surveillance on us for several weeks. And we intercut with a middleman standing by the window as Lacey stands aside, stunned. Someone planted surveillance on us? Who? Wendy turns to the metal box. Inside on a stand is a diamond tennis bracelet. The one given to her by Tyler in episode 12, the palindrome rehearsal pa rever blah, 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 the <laughs> Damn you, Javi. The palindrome <laughs> reversal palindrome. My boyfriend. And off Wendy's rage, we smash cut to. We're in Jolly Fat's interrogation room. Tyler stands on the interrogation room chair, heads, arms, and body bound by straps. Who sent you? How long have you known about me being a middleman? Before you started dating me? I swear to you, I got the bracelet from Inservant Neville. So you're working for him? Yes. I mean, what, I, I don't understand what's going on here. What is a middleman? <laughs> Did you set us up to be killed? Killed? Um, you're a temp. <laughs> Drop the act, Fordo. I want answers. When Servant Neville and I were on his helicopter on the way to a meeting, I told him the same thing I told you, that I always dreamt of giving my lady diamonds, and the next day he handed me the bracelet, called it a bonus for all my whole, all my hard, hard work. What is this place? Are you a spy or something? And off Wendy, storming out and slamming the door. Now we're in the corridor, continuous. Wendy meets the middleman who stands at a control panel in the hallway. He's been monitoring. I say we detonate a truth bomb in there. No need to, Dubby. He said he loved me. I slept with him. The room's lie detection system is online. If his voice, cardiac stress, and venous pressure analysis is accurate, he's telling the truth. I know young Tyler's record backwards and forth. He doesn't have the resources to hide a cloaked nanovisual ultra-low frequency surveillance module in the crystalline structure of a lab-grown diamond. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler Ford isn't our enemy. It's Minservant Neville. Well, it's 
not going to take Minservant Neville long enough, long to figure out that we put his turbocharged tennis bracelet in a virtual reality simulation loop. Which is why you need to get over your anger and help me get Tyler on our side. And now we cut to headquarters, ops. Moments later, Tyler follows Wind and the middleman into the ops, eyes wide open with confused wonder. Okay, let me get this straight. All the time we've been dating, you have been a covert operative for the world's most absurdly secretive organization <laughs> fighting monsters and aliens and robots. Yes. So you've been lying to me since we met. If, if she deceived you, Tyler, it's because I demanded it. It's my fault, not hers. And don't forget, you were a recruit of this organization, but for a twist of fate, it could have been you in the uniform. It's just that I, if I'd known, I might have realized that I got my job with Minservant Neville in Fatboy Industries because he wanted someone on the inside. All that time I was wearing that suit doing Minservant Neville's bidding, all I was ever good for was to give you a bracelet. Tyler, there's things we need to understand. Why would Minservant Neville kidnap succubi, mediums, and clairvoyants? Um, I think I missed that memo. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what about Kerr Avon Labs? Kerr Avon. They're doing the software integration for the polydi-tetrahexamonotrioctalon. Prophecies of Auric! A polydi-tetrahexamonotrioctalon? <laughs> You've heard of it. <laughs> Not since that cheese ball supervillain Dr. Servalon tried to build one to turn all the cell phones in the world into monomaniacal hive mind. <laughs> so this polydi-tetrahexamon, I can't do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this polydi-tetrahexamonotrioctalon is some kind of hive mind maker? <laughs> Go back to Jamaica, greenie. <laughs> It's the device that's going to upload the new software upgrade to all the U-Masters in the world, linking every U-Master out there into a single, infinitely powerful network. One in every 25 people in the world have U-Masters. Imagine the massive supernatural ability of all those stolen pineal glands coupled with the unlimited computing power of such a network. A person whose access to the psychic plane, turbocharged by the power of so many U-Masters, would be able to read everyone's thoughts, plant suggestions in their minds, and maybe even shape the very nature of reality itself. With a working polydi-tetrahexamonal triathlon, when Servant Neville will have the power of a living god! <laughs> Not if we can stop him before the update goes live. <laughs> I know all of Minserve and Neville's secret codes. I know the headquarters of Fat Boy Industries like the back of my hand and can get to the polydetector hexamino triathlon. Grand Central, lead the way. Wait, I don't want you to get involved. Well, because you love me or because you don't trust me? Boss, could you turn around for a second? The middleman turns around and Wendy plants a kiss on Tyler. And off the middleman, pensive, we cut to changing room. The middleman stands by a phone on the wall. Hello, Lacey. And we split screen with Lacey in the loft. Hi, Wendy's boss. <laughs> I was starting to think that what happened this morning... Do, do you wish it didn't happen? No, but I was starting to think that I dreamt the whole thing. That, and I'm not sure I'm ready to have two people in my life with those darned watches. Lacey, listen to me. It happened, and it will again. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, if, if, if you wanted to. I do. I... I just have some business to take care of. Uh, will you wait for me? Hmm. I've waited this long, haven't I? And off the moment, we cut to Fatboy Tower establishing night. You've seen it in the Clotharian Contamination Protocol. Chiron, Fatboy Tower, corporate headquarters of Fatboy Industries and Minservant Neville, 8.30 p.m. This is Minservant Neville's private entrance. From these tunnels, he has private access to every room in the facility. Now we're inside the polydi-tetrahexamonotriactalon chamber, night. Tyler ushers winning the middleman through an octagonal door. And as promised, I have the codes. So ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce the polydi-tetrahexamonotriactalon. And we reverse angle to reveal the polydi-tetrahexamonotriactalon. A giant Jack Kirby-style machine. The hundreds of harvested supernatural pineal glands are prominent in a transparent chamber of the machine's core. The superstructure of the machine looks like a conflagration of massive U-Masters, all waiting to be activated and dominate the world inside a massive chamber full of catwalks, mezzanines, and the like. Look at all those pineal glands. Hundreds of them. It's like a glandnado. <laughs> a tornado made of glands? Yes. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> 
Well, the middleman, as the middleman reaches for into his utility belt for a grenade, you have to admit my plan is sheer elegance in its draconian <laughs> complexity. <laughs> Min servant Neville, and we reveal. Men servant Neville stepping out from the core of the machine onto an upraised platform that makes him quite dramatically the centerpiece of the array that makes up the polydi-tetrahexamono trioctalon. It must have been ten years ago that I identified your organization as the only thing on earth that could stand in my way. It took a lot of time and money to conceal my work from you, to harvest the thousands of pineal glands I needed without disturbing the psychic plane of the world and setting off your hadar. To identify young Mr. Ford as the linchpin in your destruction, first as a potential recruit, and then because of his relationship with young Miss Watson. But now, everything has gone exactly as I have foreseen. <laughs> From Miss Wasserman's distress call to your reaching for your concussive shockwave generator to destroy my machine. If you know your concussive shockwave generator so well, then you know. Click. The middleman activates a switch on top of the grenade. Now that I've pushed the failsafe detonation switch, no force on Earth can stop the destruction of your infernal machine. And then something strange happens. The middleman's grenade turns into a block of cheese. <laughs> Hey, did your grenade just transform into a block of cheese? <laughs> the middleman looks at the block of cheese in his hand, dumbstruck, as Wendy pulls out her BTRS scanner. BTRS scanner sound effect. Borp? Uh, yes. At the molecular level. That can only mean one thing. If somebody here has the power to change reality at will. The software upgrade has already gone live. And the polydi-tetrahexamonotrioctalon has been active all this time? Of course it has, you imbecile! <laughs> No. Wendy draws her sidearm, only to see it transformed into a fuzzy pink bunny. <laughs> Wendy looks at the cute creature in her hand as Monservant Neville gloats. Did you really think I would leave something as epic as this to chance? All my life, I've worked to make Fat Boy Industries the most socially proactive company. I went green, gave to the poor, set up solar farms, and personally saved the whales. <laughs> <laughs> but it hasn't been enough. The world insists on continuing on its self-destructive path towards total pollution. Now that I've harnessed the power of high technology and the force of the supernatural world to make myself into a living god, I will use the power to make the world a better place. <laughs> I've seen this before, my servant Neville. No man can take all of this upon himself. This volume of power will twist your mind and corrupt your soul. Not my mind, not my soul. As I speak, every you master in the world is networking. My brain. And as Monservant Neville speaks, we go outside to the streets of the city and we see people with their U Masters, but the U Masters escape the grasp of their owners and levitate into the air, swarming around tall buildings as they fly into the atmosphere, and finally forming a web around the earth united by luminous beams of psychic energy. With my web of psychoactive technology reaching every corner of the planet, tapping into the very consciousness of every living creature, I have the power to shape the very fabric of reality. And I shall begin by reversing the greenhouse effect at the speed of thought. Then I shall turn all of the petrol-burning cars of the world into efficient hydrogen fuel cell vehicles with a flick of my finger. I will cause all of the endangered species to propagate with a wink of my eye. And then, then I will turn all the beans of this world into peas. <laughs> Excuse me? With my hand on this world's heavenly tiller, ferrets shall become marmots. Rugs will be soup and adobe blocks will transmogrify into rods of uranium, where shall be a new world order. The power has driven him mad. Tyler steps up to the middleman, whispers. I know where the off switch is. Keep him talking. <laughs> Watch your six. Break. As the following exchange takes place, Tyler breaks from the pack and rushes toward an Edison switch hidden somewhere in all of the catwalks of this architecturally varied space. Men servant Neville. You may think quite highly of yourself, but surely you know that free minds will never submit to your dominion. You are wrong, and I will prove it to you. When the time comes, you will surrender yourself willingly to me. Um, that's never gonna happen. You'll find it a lot easier to agree once I've taken everything that matters from you. And with that, Monservant Neville reaches out with one hand and fires a bolt of lightning at Tyler. Tyler screams, his body twisting in agony, as his life energy is completely drained by Monservant Neville's onslaught. <laughs> And any resemblance to Emperor Palpatine's force lightning <laughs> is strictly coincidental. No! no, really. Even if Tyler should become transparent for a moment and you should see his skeleton. <laughs> Wendy rushes over, 
catching Tyler as when Servant Neville's attack ends and he collapses into her arms. Tyler. The middleman arrives as Wendy's side as, he, as the tears well up in her eyes. He's... And he won't be the first until you give in to my reign. When Servant Neville holds up his hands once more, BAMF! Wendy and the middleman are transported, Dr. Manhattan style, to the loft, hallway, night. Wendy and the middleman, posi their position is unchanged, only there's no Tyler in Wendy's arms. Tyler. Please. Wendy. Give me an order. I I'm sorry. Give me an order. Wendy drives the middleman against the wall, tears of rage streaming from her eyes. Tell me what I have to do to take down that son of a bitch, and I will do it. Give me an order. Men servant Neville transported us here, teleported us here for a reason. He wants to punish us. We need to find Lacey and Mr. Noser at once. And we cut to Noser inside the loft, trapped inside a massive diamond. Mr. Noser! Can we cut him out of there? It's a massive emerald cut diamond. He's probably in some kind of stasis. Wendy? Is that you? The middleman and Wendy exchange glances then as he leads the way, bounding up the spiral stairs. We cut to Wendy's room. Lacey lies in Wendy's bed, covered by the sheets. The middleman reaches over and pulls the sheet from over Lacey's face to reveal that her skin is gray, her face is ravaged by bruises, and her hair is falling out. L Lacey, no. I don't know what happened. Nozer was rehearsing downstairs because Anvil was welding in the living room again, and I came up here to take a nap. What's wrong with me? I feel weak. The middleman gathers Lacey up in his arms. Lacey, Lacey, listen to me. Everything is going to be okay. You lie back, close your eyes, sleep, and when you wake up, this will all have been a bad dream. Do you believe me? Yes. I love you, Lacey Thornfield. And off the middleman, kissing Lacey on the forehead, we smash cut to the corridor of the loft day. The middleman strides down with purpose. We can't just leave her there. We gotta figure out what's going on. T-cell polymphocytic leukemia. How do you know? The middleman barrels into the elevator, shuts the cage after Wendy, punches the down button. Her name was Tamara Tarlow. I'm sorry, uh, her name has been changed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. <clears throat> Her name was not Tamara Tarlow. <laughs> Her name was Ravina Rao. And she was my middleman. I thought you were recruited by a man. As the middleman speaks, images of his early days as a middleman illustrate his speech. And he looks a little bit like he did in episode 12, the palindrome reversal palindrome. Long hair, leather vest, goatee, tie. He spars with Ravina, training with her, fights off a giant space helmet we wearing, ray gun wielding octopus with her. Now you know the truth. Ravina Rao was a beautiful, competent, accomplished, and she transformed me from a long haired CO punching hothead to the man I am now. We did a lot of good in the world, and eventually we couldn't deny what we felt. We did our work, we loved each other, and then one day she came down with this random, meaningless disease. After all the evil we put down, all the mad scientists and aliens. All it took was a conglomeration of rogue cells and there was nothing I could do. She fought it, she suffered, and she was strong and optimistic even at the end when the disease had ravaged her body. When she passed, I cut my hair, shaved my goatee, changed my uniform to match hers. The middleman opens the cage to the elevator and as he barrels down the hallway to the, loft of the, to the, to the door of the loft of the building. And I swore an oath that I would live clean, forsake all vice and profanity, and do my work without failure. In her honor. Men servant Neville. He's read our minds. This is how he's going to get us to surrender to him. The middleman reaches the front door of the building, turns to face Wendy. Not like this. The power of Chalk Mall is in our vault. It and it alone will allow us to raise the army we need to eradicate this god gone mad. And come vampire puppets, quantum singularities, or zombie fish, I'm going to use it. The middleman shoves the door open, shoves open the doors to the loft, and Wendy uh, shoots out an expletive. Holy fuck! <laughs> Reverse angle to reveal the world as transformed by Monservant Neville. It's like a Hieronymus Bosch painting in the Middleman universe. A giant Zeppelin with the head of Fatboy Industries mascot at its prow hovers overhead, lecturing the world. All citizens must recycle their underpants. <laughs> All underpants must be turned into the local cat spaying facility. All cheese will be pasteurized on pain of death. And on the street. <laughs> People with squids for heads run wildly, chased by massive badgers wielding flamethrowers. 
Hordes of morbidly obese men get by on spider legs. Two buildings battle each other with giant biceps jutting from their sides. A bus made of fur crashes into a giant ladybug while firefighters shoot marshmallows from flamethrower-like tanks while standing on mushroom caps. A squad of Volkswagen minibuses with wings flies in the background. And now we cut to a series of newscasters from around the world. An American newscaster. The president attempted to call out the National Guard to deal with the bizarre occurrences overtaking the nation today, but was promptly distracted by the sight of his left hand becoming as large as a rhino with polka dots. And now we see a French, a French newscaster. Le tour est fait transformé en posant mort aujourd'hui. And now we see a newscaster with the head of a duck. Quack. <laughs> and now we resume on the middleman and Wendy. Man, some other Beep! played way too much Super Mario when they were kids. <laughs> and now Middle we hear an amplified stormtrooper voice. Middleman, Wendy Watson, you are to be persecuted at every turn. And reverse reveal fat boy stormtroopers in body armor with large plastic heads that look like the fat boy industry's mascot, carrying massive weapons and riding kangaroos with armadillo-like plates and spikes. Your possessions will be taken from you. You will be made to walk the streets in suits made of cactus and be flagellated by talking fish. There will be no quarter. I found our ride. Let's go. And we smash cut to Lacey's Vespa. Moments later, the middleman steers down the street going crazy while Wendy holds onto his waist with one arm and throws grenades at the pursuing stormtroopers with another. Keep him at bay. We're almost there, and I have reinforcements waiting. What kind of reinforcements? Old, crazy, and pissed. <laughs> <laughs> the middleman points ahead to reveal outside of Jolly Fat's Weehawk and Temp Agency where Ida stands before the front door looking cranky. You two Krunkensteins truly fudged the feather bed this time. <laughs> the middleman skits the Vespa to a halt and dismounts. Slow him down, Ida. Oh, yeah. This is much better than watching my stories. The middleman and Winnie don't even look back as they rush inside. Ida turns to face the stormtroopers, the expression on her face hardening. Hey, hamburgers, get some. <laughs> Ida morphs into full combat mode and unleashes a hail of gunfire that stops the kangaroo riding stormtroopers on their tracks. It's a big gunfight. Ida's firing machine guns, grenade launchers, until one of the kangaroos opens its mouth to fire a missile, which closes the distance to Ida. Kabloom! Ida explodes in a million pieces, and as her head flies up into the air, half consumed by fire, and her robotic endoskeleton is revealed Terminator style. Morons! <laughs> Now we're inside Middleman Headquarters, the corridor. Wendy and the Middleman tear ass inside. Now we're inside Ops, continues the fat boy stormtroopers follow. They storm in, firing their weapons wildly, destroying everything. The Hadar blows up, it falls, cratering the compass road in a, the, the compass road in a ball of fire. Now we're inside the corridor of the headquarters. The Middleman and Wendy keep running. They're in the compound. Stay on target, stay on target. But one of the stormtroopers reaches in from a side hallway and grabs Wendy. The Middleman turns to see Wendy, punching out the stormtroopers. Two more arrive to grab her. Seize her, she is to be taken to Minserva Neville. Go without me. Save the world, go! The middleman go! doesn't want to, but he knows he has to. He keeps running as more stormtroopers enter the corridor, giving chase. The middleman reaches the deepest, darkest vault in headquarters, continuous. He punches in a code. The stormtroopers arrive at the entrance. The middleman turns to confront them, holding forth an idol in the shape of a black panther. Behold the power of Chuck Maul. Oh, great deity of last resort, I call upon you. Bring forth my army that it may cleanse this world like a holy thundering storm of divine retribution. Uh, but the middleman just vanishes in a puff of light and smoke. The stormtroopers are left there, staring at each other. <laughs> and we smash cut to black. And then we hear a sound. Ding! And then the parting doors of an elevator into interior, the underworld. Time has no meaning or relevance. The middleman steps out from the arriving elevator to find himself in the building lobby seen in episode 1003, The Accidental Occidental Conception. The middleman looks ahead to see the reception desk, still manned by the persnickety clerk, also seen in that episode. Chiron, the underworld. Time has no meaning or relevance. Uh, am I uh, dead? Uh, let's see. Walking, talking, don't look dead to me. But, but I'm, I'm not carrying the scythe of Muadru. Chiron, the scythe of Muadru is required for mortals traveling the underworld. Yes, well, we've done away with that ungainly thing. Here's version 2.0. <laughs> the desk clerk hands over a badge. It reads, Underworld Visitor. Time has no meaning or relevance. <laughs> and it has a picture of the middleman. The middleman clips a badge to his chest pocket and then... I hope this day would never come. The middleman turns to see Ravina Rao, a beautiful, tall and athletic uh, Indian woman in her mid-30s, dressed in an Eisenhower jacket and tie. She's a middleman. R R Ravina Rao? Hello, Clarence Colton. Yep, that's his name. <laughs> Clarence Colton. Drink it in. It always goes down smooth. 
You sure made a mess of this one. Well, what happened to the power of Shock Mall? Is, is everything fixed up in my world? And off the question, we cut to interior. The polydi-tetrahexamonal triactylon chamber. Day. Manservant Neville, who now wears priestly robes, strangely reminiscent of the master from Manos, The Hands of Fate. <laughs> and he power. approaches menacingly. <laughs> the power of Chuck Mall has failed. The middleman is dead, and you are all that remains. You murdered my boyfriend, destroyed my workplace, trapped Noser in a giant diamond, gave my best friend Lacey leukemia, and did God knows what to the only father figure I've ever known. And now we go wide to reveal that Wendy's standing atop an altar wearing a Princess Leia-like slave girl costume. <laughs> Shackled by her wrists and a neck chain to an ornate sacrificial pole. And the worst you could think to do to me was put me in a slave girl costume. This is merely the beginning. <laughs> Whatever, Pinhead. You want to make me the star in your little homemade hentai fan vid? Suit yourself. <laughs> but stop wasting my time with the monologues. Animated Japanese erotica is the last thing in my vast <laughs> and godlike cranium. <laughs> Wendy Watson. From this sacrificial altar, you will bear witness to my master stroke. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> You got it, flaunted, baby, flaunted. If you could see with my eyes, you would know that this world is much too sick to live. There is no fixing it, no way to bring about perfection, but to will it to become the only truly flawless thing in all of creation. Avoid. You're gonna destroy everything? Not destroy, purify. Cleanse the corruption of mankind's wasteful ways and bring about a singular darkness of adamantine simplicity. Nothing personal. And now we're back in the underworld where time has no meaning or relevance. Ravina, I, I need to know why I was brought here. Time has no meaning or relevance in the underworld, Clarence Colton. Won't you at least let me look at you? She puts her hands on his shoulder, sizing him up. She clearly loves him and is happy to see him. I, I, I need to know if everyone up there in my world is safe. You look so different, so clean cut. Well, when you died, I, I swore an oath. I cleaned up and took a uniform like yours. You wear it better than old Dwight D. ever did. Please, you worship that man. He wasn't the only one. And what did you hope to gain from your promise? The chance to see you again. Just when you were getting over me. I don't think I ever could. It's OK, Clarence Colton. I'd always hoped you'd let yourself love again. I'm glad you found someone. Seems cruel that the power of Chuck Mall brought you here. Can you tell me why? Honey, you called down the power of the Mayan goddess of thunder and rain as a weapon of last resort. That doesn't happen without a cost. There's an ultimate sacrifice to be made. I'm ready to make it. You always were such a fine man, so decent. Even when you had that mullet. <laughs> you like the mullet. I'm sorry it came to this. You deserve better. Deserve's not a factor. The job's the job. You taught me that. I wish I hadn't. Ravina turns to face an elevator door, which opens with a ding. This way, Clarence Colton. And now we're inside the polydi-tetrahexamono triactylon chamber. Day. Fat boy stormtroopers and scientists, the same plastic heads and lab-coated men, work feverishly while Manservant Neville lords over them. Increase energy to the psychotronic transmission field. I must have full power to bring about my great work. And as he monologues, Wendy picks the lock on the shackle, holding her to the altar. Together, we will bring about a final solution of brilliance. The shackle snaps. That will purge this diseased world of the plague of humanity. And then he turns and sees her slipping away. Stop! He outstretches his hand and zap, a bolt of lightning from Unservant Neville's hand hits Wendy who falls to the floor with a shriek. He keeps zapping her, causing her ever escalating levels of pain and yes, causing her skeleton to be seen through her skin on occasion. <laughs> Your feeble skills are no, no match for the power of the polydi-tetrahexamonotrioctalon. Zap! You will pay the price for your lack of vision. Ready, guys? Yeah. Shut the Beep. fuck up! <laughs> and kill me, Palpatine. Like I said, no resemblance. 
Anyway, um, and Servant Neville makes up his mind to oblige. He rears back, his hands bristling with power. Unlimited power! And as he leans forward, about to deliver the death blow, crash! All eyes go to the ceiling, where a now familiar elevator breaks through the roof and slams onto the floor of the polydetetrahexamono triaxalon chamber. An elevator door opens to reveal the middleman in Ravina Rao. Villain! Your reign of terror ends now. Wendy looks up and smiles. Manservant Neville glares, the infernal energy cycling around his clenched fists. Do you truly believe this is all it will take to stop me? The middleman smiles, then raises a bugle to his lips. You saw the bugle uh, in episode 1006, the uh, boy band super fan interrogation. And he blares, and dozens of elevators crash to the ceiling. Slam, 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 the middleman. Manservant Neville, behold my army. And elevators land on the floor, their doors opening, dozens of them to reveal middlemen, hundreds of them from every era imaginable. There's a three we've already established in Legends of the Middleman, Barbarian Middleman, Victorian Middleman, and World War II Middleman with the Middle Boy, and many, many more <laughs> of every race, gender, creed, and color. Medieval Middleman, Caveman Middleman, Conquistador Middleman, Civil War Middleman, Roman Middleman, Renaissance Middleman, Samurai Middleman, Sulu Middleman, Amazon Middleman, even Guy Goddard from the Obsolescent Cryogenic Mountain is there with a hook in his hand, and they're all identifiable as middlemen because in some way, all their uniforms match the color and geometry of the classic Eisenhower jacket middleman uniform. A thousand fallen middlemen, heroes all, brought back from the plane of existence your demonic powers cannot control. The middlemen all draw their weapons and aim at Manservant Neville. Fools! I will destroy you all! And he releases the lightning. Fire! The middlemen all fire at once, a fusillade that meets Manservant Neville's own salvo and annihilates it. Manservant Neville is consumed in a ball of fire from the middle weapons and his own repelled energy field, which engulfs him and all of his minions in a powerful eruption of divine retribution. <laughs> and Manservant Neville dies. Painfully. Yeah. And the gathered men, mi middlemen cheer. Wendy looks up to see, the, to see the middleman's hand reaching into frame to help her up. She grabs him in a grateful embrace. Sorry I'm late. I had it handled. I know. <laughs> Better. Nice outfit. Steel bra is a bit much. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wendy, this is Ravina Rao. If I had a nickel for every time I wound up in the slave girl outfit, <laughs> you will be a wonderful middleman. Thanks, but, um, wait a minute. What do you mean, I'll be a wonderful middleman? Someone has to take Manservant Neville's place up there, set the world straight, and destroy the polyditetra hexamonotrioxalon. Someone strong, someone who can resist the temptation of unlimited power. It's all up to you now, Clarence Colton. I understand. Clarence? <laughs> <laughs> That's your name, Clarence? What's wrong with Clarence? <laughs> I have to go. So this is it? This is, this is the ultimate sacrifice? It is. No. It's the price I have to pay. There's something that was once said to me by a very great man. There must be no regrets, no tears, no anxieties. Just go <laughs> forward in all your beliefs and prove to me that I'm not mistaken in mine. Goodbye, Wendy. The middleman turns to go, and as he walks up the long steps to the dais before the polydi-tetrahexamonotriactalon, Wendy turns to Ravina Rao. Hey, you take care of Clarence. The great thing about Clarence is he'll take care of all of us. The middleman turns to face the chamber and raises his arms and is engulfed by a celestial light, and we go to Earth's orbit. As all the U-Masters unnetwork, their beams of light seizing, their glow diminishing, and they speed back down to Earth. The middleman stands godlike on the dais, surrounded by floating U-Masters against the epic background of the polydi-tetrahexamonotrioctalon and the foreground of an army of middlemen. And we're looking at Wendy, alone in the frame, a tear welling in her eye. Goodbye. And the page fades to black. And now we just see a single speech balloon in the darkness. Jeepers, Dubby. That was one humdingingly weird day. <laughs> and we fade in. We're inside Wendy and Lacey's loft, the hallway, day. The middleman opens the elevator cage door to usher Wendy into the hallway. Chiron, corridor to the illegal sublet Wendy shares with another young photogenic artist, 5.30 p.m. the next day. Wasn't it? 
uh, the humdinging weird day. What the f <laughs> What are we doing here? What's going on? Oh, I'm just walking you home after a tough and challenging day at our very eclectic workplace. <laughs> Did you set the world straight? Yo, Wendy Watson. Wendy looks over to see Noser, sitting at his usual spot, strumming his guitar. Hey, Noser. You know what I see? Trees of green? Red roses, too. <laughs> it is a wonderful world. That's what I say to myself. <laughs> Wendy turns to the middleman. But you're here. What about the ultimate sacrifice? Well, it's been taken care of. And that's when the door to Wendy's loft opens and Lacey barrels out, grabbing Wendy by the arm. Wendy, where have you been? Um, at work. Well, you better get your butt in here and get ready. Tyler's record release party is in like 90 minutes and we're going to be late. Tyler's record release? Hello, Earth to Wendy Watson. Wendy looks over to see Tyler, alive and smiling and completely unaware of any of the events of the story, stepping up. Tyler! You're... Yeah, a major label recording artist who's about to miss his debut because his girlfriend's a raging alcoholic. Yes, yes, I am. Wait, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, workaholic. Workaholic. <laughs> workaholic. Now, now that's... I take my eyes off the page for one second. Now that's what I call a retcon. <laughs> Wendy throws the non-alcoholic Wendy... <laughs> Always trying to rewrite me. Should I say it again? Throws her arms around Tyler, shocked. I love you, Tyler Ford. I love you too, Wendy Watson. I keep thinking that if I hadn't followed your advice and taken that job with Fat Boy Industries, I never would have gotten my big break. Hey, hate to break up the romance novel, but uh, Perfect Warren's gonna be here any minute. Perfect and Warren? Did you get hit on the head or something? That boy is perfect. And, uh... Who is this guy? And that's when Wendy does a double take, realizing what's going on here. That's... Lacey, that's my boss. Pillow lips. <laughs> Sexy boss man. Right. Whatevs. Look, it's nice to finally meet you, Wendy's boss. You two never met? No, I never met him. Why would I? But I gotta put my foot down anyway. She can't do any more work today. This is a huge night for Wendy and her boyfriend, and and for me and my boyfriend. And it's, it's okay. I was just leaving. I'll see you tomorrow. You'll find your job right where it was, just like everything else. Lacey turns her back on the middleman, ushering Wendy into the loft. So just this morning, Perfect Warren found this bile. Dee -dee 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 -dah. <laughs> so, <duh. laughs> <clears throat> just this morning, Perfect Warren found this bile diesel power limousine that we're all gonna ride in the party, and it's gonna be really awesome. Wendy turns to look back her face full of sorrow and gratitude, knowing everything that her boss gave up for them, all to be here. And she sees the middleman walking down the hallway, standing straight, holding his head up high, a man who tonight will sleep the sleep of the just, knowing that he did the right thing by the world. And for a moment, the middleman is etched against the evening light, a shadow surrounded by goodness. He is her hero, he is our hero, and that is the end of the saga of the middleman. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the cast. This this series ending finale was written by myself, Javier Guido Markswatch, and Hans Beimler. The writers of The Middleman are Margaret Dunlap, Andy Reeser. Sarah Watson. Hans, are you here? Are you with us? No, I, I don't know if he's here or not, but let's give him another round of applause, Hans Feinberg. The pure and unadulterated evil of Manservant Neville was brought to life by Mark Shepard. The sweet lovin' that is Tyler Ford was brought to life by Brendan Hines. The unmistakable musical zen of Mr. Noser was interpreted by Jake Smollett. The cranky but lovable robot stylings of Ida were brought to life by Mary Pat Gleason. The stalwart romantic idealism of Lacey Thornfield could only be essayed by Britt Morgan. The plucky, snarky, geeky heroism of Wendy Watson is something that would not exist on God's green earth without Natalie Morales. 
And finally, the only man alive strong enough to bring you the square-jawed heroics of the middleman is, of course, Matt Kiesler. Thank you for letting us entertain you.